go and preach at a particular church. Uh, in, in fact, in the church that my mother grew up in uh, on the other side of Louisiana. And so he went there and preached. And she had never heard preaching like that before. And she knew it was of the Lord. And so she packed her things and she moved to the other side of Louisiana with with her great aunt, with her auntie and her uncle, which was my great aunt and uncle. And so my mother uh, was uh, had just turned 22 and had got a job at a working at a cafe. And so she would pass by this cafe um, <clears throat> on her and pass by this particular uh, place on her way to her job at this cafe. And my father, uh, his his uh, house was there at, at this place and uh, he would be sitting out on the porch when she would pass by. And so he one day asked her if she needed a ride and she said, no, thank you. Uh, my father was 18 years older than my mother, you see. And so she said, no, thank you. And she just kept on walking. And so she said that day on her lunch break, she was sitting there uh, eating her lunch. And he walked in the cafe and uh, told her, I'm going to marry you. You know, now that was that was their first conversation, you see. <laughs> and so she said, no, no, you're not going to marry me, except they were married that same year, you see. And so five years later, I was born. But but, but they both started going to this church uh, the, at the time, Brother Junior was over, and uh, he he said he never was called a pastor. It was just the Lord had him teaching there, and so <clears throat> in between this time, between the time my father and mother were married, and that I was born, which was five years later, uh, Brother Junior tells me that he had had a vision uh, that he saw a young man that the Lord would raise up, and he said that the Lord told him that the wisdom that the Lord, he would give this young man would. Uh, would be beyond his age and told him different things about this young man. And so some years later, I'm born. And <clears throat> my, one of my first memories is being in this church and seeing Brother Junior up preach. And I'm thinking as a child now, I'm thinking one day I'm going to be his pastor, you see. And some 29 years later, I was asked to be his pastor. He had asked me while I was sitting in his living room if I would pastor that church, which I did. I pastored it. Uh, for a few years there, you see. And so it was all the Lord's doing. Now, this same man, Brother Junior, uh, the Lord dealt with him in a way that he don't deal with a whole lot of people today, you see. And going back to that song, um, He Hides Me From the Rain, uh, Brother Junior was the type of person that the Lord would speak to him through visions and things like that, mostly. And uh, he would be warned of, of things that was going to take place in particular cities, and his job was to go and tell the preachers of that city what was going to take place and why. And so Brother Junior was, um, according to him, he was afraid of storms and things like that because when he was a child, a tornado had hit his house, and when he woke up, he, he was outside. In other words, when he woke up, he was laying in his bed, but the the tornado had ripped his roof and the, and the walls off. So it was just a house with no no ceiling, no roof, and no walls, you see. So, you know. <laughs> and so from that point on, he was scared of storms. And so one day the Lord told him to go to the city of Lake Charles and to warn them that he was going to send a hurricane there because of their iniquities. And so <clears throat> he was working with a particular brother in the ministry and uh, they had got stalled some kind of way, and the brother had stalled him and told him, well, just wait until we get to that side, and then you can go warn him. But by the time they got there, uh, the storm had already passed. So then the Lord came to him again and said, I'm going to send another hurricane. You go warn him and tell him this one is going to be more deadly. But you go tell him what I've told you, you know. And so he was scared of the storm. And so when the hurricane hit, uh, his family was in a room all uh, huddled up together, and he was out in the living room praying um, in, in front of the door. He was knelt down in front of his uh, door there praying. And as he was praying, the Lord spoke to him and said, go up, get up and go outside. And so he got up and he went outside and he kept walking until he got to his front gate. And then the Lord told him to turn around and go back. And so he went back to and stood under his porch. And when he looked uh, now, it's storming outside, it's raining, you know, just like it would when a hurricane would come through. But when he looked, his clothes were not wet at all. And 
the wind, he noticed that as he was walking, the wind wasn't blowing his clothes. And he said, the Lord spoke to him and said, this is a sign to you. This is a sign for you that I'm not going to let this hurricane harm you. You go and tell those people what I've told you. And so he went down there unharmed. And so it goes back to that song, um, Hide Me From The Rain, how he walked out there in all of that rain and the Lord didn't let him get wet at all. You see, and it was a sign for him. And that's the kind of relationship that the Lord wants us to have with him, the kind that will know him. And he's tangible, you know, to us. And God wants to be tangible to us. Uh, but he, he, for us to be tangible to him and for us to be tangible to him, we have to be close enough to him, you see. And so <clears throat> if you remember in the, in the uh, book of Genesis, uh, we read about Adam and Eve, how according to the word of God, that he would come down in the cool of the evening to talk with them. But one day when he got down there to talk to them, they were gone. They were hiding. So when he called out for them, they answered and told him, we're hiding. We heard your voice and we hid. Well, the question is, why were they hiding? Because of sin. You see, because of sin in their lives. And it's that same thing today, that today... People are hid from God and, and God hide from people because of their because of their sin, you see. So God wants to be tangible to us. Amen. Now let's go real quick. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the 29th chapter of the book of uh, Proverbs. Twenty ninth chapter of Proverbs, and we're going to read verse eighteen. <clears throat> it reads, "Where there is no vision, the people perish; but he that keepeth the law, happy is he." Now, that word "vision" there—that's uh, not just a regular word for something that is seen, like you know, where if you can't. If you can see it, you can achieve it and things like that. That word vision is talking about like a heavenly vision. It's talking about an actual vision from the Lord. And look at what that says there. Where there is no vision, the people perish. And so in reality, what that's saying is where no vision is perceived by people, they perish. Now let's go real quick to the second chapter of First Corinthians. Now, uh, let's, let's look at what that was talking about there. When, where there is no vision, the people perish. Oftentimes, what happens with people, you see, is when they don't hear or they don't see a vision from God, they continue on in life, really sometimes not even expecting to hear or see anything from God. And they continue on in their life, and, and what is produced from that is this gospel that we hear today, where basically you have your own dream and God is just there to fulfill it for you. Instead of God having a vision for you and showing you that vision and you walking it out according to his will. Now it's about we can do our own thing and God is just there to make it happen. He's just there riding shotgun with us uh, to make those things happen that we want to happen. He's there to be our personal genie to make sure that our wishes are fulfilled. See, that's your vision. But this word is talking about where there is no vision from God, the people perish. In other words, you can be a millionaire and still perish. You may have fulfilled your own dreams in your life and you'll still perish. Let's read the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. We'll start reading at verse 9. It says, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So look, let's look at this. It's talking about three different things here now. Eyes, your natural eyes, have not seen. Your natural ears have not heard. Neither have entered into your heart. Three things. You see, 
the things which God hath prepared for them that what? Love him. So, here's the question. Have, what has God prepared for them that don't love him? This is for people that love him. No matter how much you love God, your eyes will not see, nor will your ears hear, nor will you ever be able to conceive it in your heart, what he has for you. Let me make, make that clear, what he's saying there. Your natural eyes, your natural ears, nor your imagination will ever perceive what God has for you. It will never perceive that. Your natural eyes, your natural ears, your imagination, I don't care how good it is, it will not perceive what God has for you. Let's keep reading. Verse 10. But God hath revealed him, them, unto us by what? Now, let's go back to verse 9 there. This is talking about the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So you see that? This is talking about the people that love him with all their heart. This is not talking about folks that's just sitting in church every Sunday. And their relationship with God is based on them going to church or uh, doing other religious acts. You see? This is talking about people that love him. Never mind folks that go to church every Sunday or folks that are doing other religious activities. He's not talking about those people. He's talking about people that love him. He's telling these people that love him with their whole heart, you will not perceive with your eyes, ears, or your imagination what I have for you. Now we have to make that clear up front. No amount of education will prepare you for what God has for you. You can read all of the books in the world. You still won't have enough imagination to gather those things that God has for you. Read that verse 10 says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. By what? Come up here, Donald Ray. Here, you stand right here. Now I'm going to talk to you. Okay. And I want you to repeat after me. You hear me? All right. Donald Ray is going to accomplish good things. Donald Ray is going to accomplish good things. All right. While you were saying that, I was thinking something in my mind. Can you tell me what I was thinking? Why not? Um. Why couldn't he tell me what I was thinking? See, because he was listening with his ears. And see, when we you can go sit down now. When we were born, we were born and we were trained to hear with our ears and to perceive with our eyes. And, and after we get saved, if we don't have a preacher that can tell us how to hear God without this and without this, we'll be in trouble. God will speak to us in an audible voice. And many of us have heard the, the voice of God audibly. You see that? But the things of God, the things that God has for you, is revealed by his spirit. Let's keep reading there, read verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, not by his voice, by his spirit. Let's keep reading. For the Spirit searcheth all things. Yeah, the deep things of God. What does that mean? Your eyes will only allow you to see so much. Let me explain what I mean. If God would come down and show you everything naturally with, with your eyes or what he wanted for you or the things that he had for you, your eyes send the signal to your mind and that's where reasoning takes place. 
And before you know it, you're reasoning yourself, you're reasoning yourself or thinking about how is that going to happen? How is this going to take place? God, how are you going to allow that to take place? Let's go real quick to the uh, 59th chapter of Isaiah. Hold your spot there in 1 Corinthians and we'll go to the 59th chapter of Isaiah. And we're going to read verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Now, that's God's response to people all the time that try to reason with their eyes, with their ears, and, and their five senses, in other words. God's hand is not shortened. And so when he tell us naturally so what's going to take place, naturally so we begin to reason why it can't take place. And, and because of that, our lack of faith negates what it is that he wants to do on this earth through us. You see that? Now let's go right back real quick to the, tw to the uh, second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Says, but God hath not revealed them, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Why? For the spirit searcheth all things. Eyes don't do that. The eye searcheth what it knows or what it naturally sees. But that's not all things. Yeah, the deep things of God. Not the surface stuff. In other words, verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So let me tell you what the number one problem is of people in, in this world. Look at what that says there. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but what? The spirit of God. If you don't have the spirit of God, you can forget about hearing from him. Look at what it says in the first part of that verse. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man, the spirit of man, of a man, which is in him. Everybody see that? So man is born with a spirit. When that's, that's why you're still living. It's because your spirit is on the inside of you. You see, and it is that spirit that's not born again. It's that spirit that causes you to sin. It's that spirit that does that. That's the spirit that works against the spirit of God until you become born again. Now, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. What's the new creation? His spirit is now born again. His spirit is what's born again. Let's look at what, 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 what Jesus told uh, Nicodemus. I think it's in the third chapter of John. Let's back, let's go there real quick. All right, third chapter of the book of uh, John, we'll start reading in verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, let, let, let's ask, let's think about that, what he's saying there. What does that have to do with what Jesus, with what Nicodemus said? Was Jesus just off his rocker and just bringing up something completely different 
you know, in reference to what Nicodemus is saying. Let's read that again. What did he say unto Jesus? Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. And, and then Jesus answered him, saying, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what does that have to do with what Nicodemus said? Remember what we said, what the kingdom of God is? It's the way that God does things in this earth. Whenever a miracle takes place, it's because the kingdom of God is present to make it take place. Does everybody understand that? There are no miracles that take place in, in this kingdom, in this worldly kingdom. No matter how much power and authority you get, you can run for president and become president. That doesn't make you have the power of God on the inside of you. So simply put, the kingdom of God comes in the power of God. And so Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, we know that you are a teacher sent from God because no man can do the miracles that you do except God have sent him. And look at what Jesus says. You can't see the kingdom unless you're born again. Now, let me explain what he's talking about. And remember, the kingdom of God is God's way of doing things. Remember what Jesus told his disciples to preach? Preach, go, go unto the world, go ye into the world, preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And see, they thought he was talking about an earthly kingdom. What he was talking about was the spiritual kingdom, that kingdom that overrides this natural kingdom. In the natural kingdom, you're going to get sick, you're going to get cancer, you're going to get AIDS. All of those things come with the natural kingdom. God's kingdom says, my power overrides cancer, AIDS, arthritis. You see that? And so <clears throat> here, Nicodemus says, we know that you are a teacher sent from God because no man can do those miracles except God send him. And Jesus responds with, but you can't even see the miracles unless you're born again. Now, let me explain what Jesus is talking about. The power of God. One of the last miracles Jesus performed was raising a man up from the dead that had been dead for four days. The people that did not believe in Jesus Christ, instead of them saying, well, you know, we know now that God is with him and we can't, we shouldn't go against him. Because of this great miracle, they knew that Lazarus had been dead for four days. This wasn't some stunt that him and Lazarus had got together and decided to do to show the people who he was. They knew this man had been dead for four days. But yet and still, the Bible tells us that after he had raised Lazarus from the dead, that not only did they seek to kill Jesus, but they sought to kill Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Why? Because they could not see the kingdom of God. Yeah, they witnessed the miracle. So what does that mean? Naturally, so you can see God do all kinds of things in your life. But if you're not born again, it's not going to mean anything. You will constantly revert back to what your natural flesh reverts back to is unbelief. You see that all throughout the Old Testament where God delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And every time he showed off for them, every time he gave them a miracle, he brought all of those plagues into Egypt to show them that his power was greater than the gods of the Egyptians. He delivered them by the Red Sea. He gave them manna from heaven every single day. Every single day those people woke up and saw a miracle there laying on the ground. Every single day. The Bible says that their clothes didn't grow old. In other words, if you were five years old when you came out of Egypt, when you were 45 and going into the promised land, you still had on the exact same clothes. They grew with you supernaturally. They saw all of those miracles and still all throughout those 40 years, 
They tempted God and tested him because of their unbelief. Why? Be exactly because of what Jesus said here in the third chapter of John. Except you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. Yeah, you might see it naturally. The results of the kingdom of God. But you won't see it spiritually. Let's keep reading here. The third chapter of John. Fourth verse says, Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and what? Of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That is which is born of the flesh is flesh. That means that it's not enough for you to come down and say, okay, Lord, I give my life to you. Thank God I accept you, you know, for what you did for me on the cross. Hallelujah, I'm saved. I can stand up here and I can, I can preach the cross to you, preach it, preach it, preach it, and I could convince your flesh that you need to get saved. And you may feel condemned about living in sin and about what you've done. And you may genuinely think, I really need to be saved. And I'm really going to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. But until you are given that born again spirit, you're no better than Judas. Let's think about it. Judas followed Jesus Christ. For three and a half years. But he never received that born again spirit. That's the reason why you have so many people. Come to the altar. Give their life to the Lord. And then go right back out into the world. And live out in the world. There's no change. On the inside of them. And then they wonder. What in the world is taking place? Why do I still have the same thoughts? Why do I still have the same mind? The same carnal mind? Why? Because that which is flesh, that that's born of the flesh is flesh. Let's keep reading here. And, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Does everybody see? And so until God puts a new spirit on the inside of you, that born again spirit, you're still the same person. You see, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 7, Moreover not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master, in other words, a teacher of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we, we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? Let's keep reading. And no man hath ascended un up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Does everybody understand that? And so what is the Lord telling us? Let's go back now to the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Think about it like this. Um, we have a television. We have a VCR or a DVD player. Well, the remote for the television is not going to work for the DVD player. And the remote for the DVD player is not going to work for the television. Why? Because there's a transmitter on the inside of the remote. And there is what you call a receiver on the inside of the television and the DVD player. And they work on what is called frequencies. 
And so if the frequency for the, for the DVD player is set at 6.1 megahertz, then something, then a, a transmitter that is set at 5.1 megahertz is not going to be able to do anything for a receiver that is set for a different frequency. Does everybody understand? And we, I mean, we've all operated remote controls, and we understand you can't t use the TV remote to turn on the, on, the, on the DVD player. You have to program it, in other words. It has to be something on the inside of that television, on something on the inside of that DVD player that's going to receive the signal that is sent. And it's that same way when we're talking about what we're talking about now. The Spirit of God is put on the inside of you to receive God's signal. Your man, your spirit man, can't receive the things of God. Let's go back to verse 10. It says, but God has revealed them unto us by what? His Spirit. For the Spirit, now notice in your Bible, is that word Spirit capitalized? That's talking about his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yeah, the deep things of God. That's not talking about your spirit. That's talking about his spirit that he put on the inside of you. That's what searches the deep things of God. Other than that, when, if you, when you're born, you'd be able to know everything that God has for you. Everybody that's born has a spirit and no spirits will be able to comprehend everything that God has for them. Except they can't. It takes God's spirit on the inside of you to even begin to search for those things that God has for you. Does everybody understand? Other than that, you're not even looking. If you don't have the spirit of God, you don't even have a mind to search for the deep things of God. You just think I can live where I want to live. I can go to church where I want to go to church. I can do what I want to do. And as long as it doesn't go against the law of God, I'm fine. And that's where 99% of Christians live today in their life. Not trying to search the deep things of God. Just get saved and continue to live life as you know it. You see. Let's keep reading verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of it, but the spirit which is what? Of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, if you're born again, you haven't received the spirit of the world. You received the spirit of God that you might know. Now, that's the only way you're going to know. Now, let me tell you where the corner mind comes in at. The corner mind knows, okay, I believe I'm saved. I believe God has done something for me. And I believe God has something for me. And so I'm going to begin to search what he has for me. Carnally. Reasoning with your natural mind. And see, the problem with the brain, with the natural brain is, it can only reason with what's already on the inside of it. Does everybody understand? If I repeat a word to you, the only way you know that word exists is if you've, ever, if you've heard it before. Your brain registers, it registers in your brain. I've heard that word before, and I know what it means. And so the carnal mind can only reason with what's on the inside of it already. Does everybody see that? It, you know, the only way you have a big vocabulary is if you read a lot of books. Or if you're around somebody that has a big vocabulary. In other words, you can only reason with what's already on the inside of there. It, it, doesn't, have the cap it doesn't have the capability of reasoning what God has for it already. You see? Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which, which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You see, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That's the reason why God can be up here preaching just as plain as day and somebody can say, I don't believe that. <laughs> and trust me when I tell you, I've heard that plenty of times. I don't believe it. I don't receive that. It, it can be in here, just in this Bible, just as plain as day. And somebody will say, I don't believe it. You know why? Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And you know what I do when I hear that? 
Now, let me make this clear. I, ain't, I don't have to hear it come out of your mouth to, to hear it. So you know what I do when I hear it? I cry and whine to God. Lord, why can't they hear it? Why don't they, why don't they receive it? No, I just go on and keep preaching. Why? Because it's apparent that the Spirit of God isn't in there. And until you get born again, you won't receive the things of God. And so I don't fight and fuss with you and, and go to other scriptures to try to prove what God is saying. I just pray that you get born again one day. I just pray that you'll receive the spirit of God so that you'll know when God is talking. No, I'm not going to argue with you over God's word. Why? Because if the spirit of God is in there, God don't have to argue with himself. There's only one reason why somebody don't receive God's word is because God is not living on the inside of them. That's all. And really just that plain. Why? Because God's not going to argue with himself. He's not senile. He don't have a split personality. If he's living on the inside of you, then that spirit is going to bear witness. That's the truth. <laughs> Verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are what? Spiritually discerned. Let's go ahead and keep reading. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Everybody see that? This Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. If we're born again. That means that God doesn't have to wrestle with your carnal mind. To get you to do what he's called, what he's called you to do. Let's go real quick to the 33rd chapter of Jeremiah. Thirty third chapter of Jeremiah. <clears throat> we'll read verse three. It says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Here's my question to each of us Do we have the mind to even call unto God? And if we say yes, then my question is this. Oh, is God showing us great and mighty things? That word mighty there is better, better translated as hidden. So, do we call unto the Lord? And then when we call unto him, are we, is he answering us? Is he showing us great and mighty things? Or in other words, hidden things. Let's go one more time. Let's go to the 59th chapter of Isaiah. And this is where we'll close. We're going to read verse 1 again and then go on to verse 2. 59th chapter of the book of Isaiah. It says, Behold, the first verse says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. In other words, when you're calling unto God, he's not deaf. And he's not saying, well, they're asking for this and I can't deliver that, so I'm going to act like I'm not hearing them. In other words, his hand is not shortened that it can't deliver what it is that, you'll ask, that you're asking for. And so what he's establishing in verse 1 is, the problem is not on my end. If you're calling to me and I'm not answering, it's not because I'm deaf and because I can't deliver what it is that you're asking for. 
verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Does everybody see that? So no, it's not that God don't have time for you. It's not that God have a million other prayers to answer and so he'll get around to you when he have time. What is it? Your iniquities. Your sins. What, what, why? Because what's sinning? Flesh. You see that? That means flesh isn't crucified. That means flesh is making more noise than spirit man is. When the spirit of God comes, it comes to crucify flesh. Does everybody understand? And so if the spirit of God is there, that's what it's going to do. It's going to make flesh be quiet so that you can hear from God. So that you can know the things that God has for you. But if flesh is alive, that means your carnal mind is continually churning. It's continually reasoning about what it thinks is right. And it cancels out the things that God has for you. If God said, y'all go down to that pool at the end of the neighborhood there and start walking on that water there, many of us would think, well, can't walk on water and many of us wouldn't even try why because in our minds we will begin to reason history and what we've already done naturally so we most of us have already been down to that pool I've already been in some kind of swimming pool and we know that when we got in the water we got in it we didn't walk on it so when we stepped in we didn't keep walking on top of it we stepped down into it And so the natural mind would begin to reason, well, this has been the history, so this is the way it is. My body answers to gravity. That's the way the corner mind thinks. But you see, Jesus Christ, when he was here, and along with Peter, they both walked on water. Why? Because their spirit man out-reasoned the natural. They They had something on the inside of them to let them know the spirit comes first and natural answers to spirit. Spirit don't natural don't answer to natural. Does everybody understand? Well, let's let's go back in the book of Genesis. The Bible says that God created Adam. And then it says he formed him. That means that he created Adam's spirit first. And then he formed a body to put that spirit on the inside of. That means that the spirit was here first. Does everybody understand? Now let me prove that. Really, the the truth is, Adam and Eve were both here at the same time. When When Adam was created, Eve was right there with him. Now that shows that the spirit was here first. And so when God created Adam's flesh, Eve was there. Now notice when it says that he when he when he made Eve a body, when he took that rib out of Adam, he didn't have to create another spirit. Does everybody understand? So in other words, spirit was here first. Let's go. Let's go real quick to the book of Genesis. Let me show you that just real briefly. Verse, let's go to chapter 5, the book of Genesis, chapter 5. Start reading verse 1. It says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Is God flesh? Does everybody see that? In the day that God created man in the likeness of God. 
is God flesh. Jesus said God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he created a spirit. Let's keep reading verse 2. Male and female. Created he them. Now let me make this. Let me say this for some of us that, is, that are here today. God is not a male. And he's not a female either. God doesn't have a gender. There's no reason for him to be a male. So he's not walking around with male organs and he's not walking around with female organs. He's neither male nor female. Does everybody understand that? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name what? What did he call them? Oh. <laughs> Both of them's name was Adam until he took Eve from the rib. <laughs> so spirit came first. And until we ate of that tree, spirit reigned. And when we began to sin, in other words, go against the law of God, that's when we were in trouble. You see, that's when now... Flesh comes first. Now, with ever since we've ate of that tree and satisfied, you know, and, 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 and did something with our appetite, we've been trying to satisfy our appetite ever since with flesh. You see that? That's why the corner mind is the enemy of God. Because the corner mind works against the things of God. It keeps you from perceiving the things that God has for you. Let's think about this. When Adam and Eve ate of that tree... All of a sudden, they knew they were naked. And so what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together. They tried to cover themselves. But God has something better for them. Before they ate of that tree, they were covered with the glory of God. After they ate of that tree, God wanted the, sheet, the, the skin of animals, in other words, to cover them. Does everybody understand that? And so even in that... We were walking with a corner mind. And that's why the corner mind, it won't perceive the things of God. Uh, let me share this with you. God has plans for everybody that's born in this world. But you don't receive those plans until you become born again. You, know, you, know, you don't even have the ears to hear the things that God wants to say to you until you become born again. And until then, people, they go to church, they sing in choirs, some of them even get up and preach without the Spirit of God, and then think that they're really hearing from God. And so they take on a spirit, but it's not the Spirit of God. And they think, let me make this clear, the devil has a spirit that mimics God's spirit. And they think, well, I, you, they know that it's something alien there. In other words, something that they weren't born with. And so they just automatically assume that's the Spirit of God. I spoke in tongues. But let me make this clear. If that's the Spirit of God that's speaking in tongues on you, it's going to amen this word when it hears it. Does everybody understand? It's not going to say that that Spirit that's on the inside of you that's speaking in tongues, that's causing that gift to come forth, is not going to say no to the very word that it wrote. That same spirit wrote this Bible. And so it's not going to have a problem with what it wrote. So I, I'm not, let me make this clear. Now we're not against the gifts of the spirit. We believe that they belong in the church today. But here's what I look for. Is that spirit on the inside of you causing you to obey this word? Is it causing you to reject this word, if, it's, if you can reject this word, it shows me that it's not the Spirit of God that's there. What author writes a book and then denies it when it's published? I didn't write that book. And God won't do that either. <laughs> Everybody understand? If he wrote it, he receives it. It's his. You see? 
And so, no, it, it's not the spirit of God if it can reject what this word wrote. What's in this Bible, in other words, not the spirit of God, you see. So God want us to line up with his spirit and he, he want to reveal to us. Now, those of us that have the spirit of God. Let's search those deep things of God. Let's see what God has for us in this life. The, the people that have done great exploits for God, they didn't do it just by reading the Bible. They didn't do it because they had some good ideas. They were seeking God. And, and let me make this clear. The things that God have told us, the things that God would say to us, they will completely go against what our mind can reason. Sister, Sister Cat, probably two years ago, you never would have thought that you'd have been living here in Tennessee, huh? <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Ten years ago, I never would have thought I'd be here in Tennessee. But because God called for it, this is where I am. You see that? If it had been in my mind, I'd probably be still in my hometown. But God's mind said different, and that's what we had to follow. Now, keep in mind, God has showed me several years ago that I'd be here in Tennessee. But it wasn't, I didn't see how. I, wasn't, I didn't have any plans on moving here. But it was in God's plan, you see. And so that spirit of God, it seeks the things of God, and it searches those things. And then it lines up with those things. And that's what God wants us to do. Not only seek him, but line up when we hear what he has to say. Amen.